Okay, do we have audio for real this time? <laughs> okay, well, for the remote people, these are talks that you missed. Uh, most of them are online. Um, so actually, so my comments weren't heard either. So you want to say that we'll do it next semester? Yeah, so next semester there will be, I'm sorry, I just forgot what Eric told me he said. Uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality uh, series of workshops yeah. next semester in the spring of 2019. Okay, great. Let us begin. So I'm here today to talk about brain diffusion imaging with DiPi and Fury. Uh, the Fury part is a new addition that I hadn't told anyone about, but this is uh, a special surprise for today's talk. So right off the bat, I want to start by just wowing you with an example, uh, an interactive example, and then we can talk about what this thing is uh, afterward. So um, let me see if I can pull this thing up. So this is a, an interactive visualization uh, built using DiPi and Fury. Uh, in this case, these are white matter tracks in the brain. Uh, and in fact, these are um, centroids of these tracks. Let me see if I can spin it around so it looks more like a brain. Um, so first of all, we have UI elements here. I have a panel that I can grab. And I'm going to filter these UI tracks. So it's labeled as size. This is actually a maximum size. So, um, or I guess it's a minimum size. So the bigger I make it, it filters out more and more. So only the biggest and richest clusters are shown. And then uh, just put that back in the middle. And then again, this filters by length. So if I uh, do this, then only the only kind of the longest tracks get shown. Now the real special part of this, if I show a few more, is I can select one, say this purple one right here, and if I hit the E key, I can expand it and show these are the actual tracks that the model has uh, gleaned from the underlying data. What we were showing before was just kind of the centroid of that tract. So this is an attempt to uh, kind of abstract away all the you know, kind of very dense uh, clusters of white matter uh, and show just, just the uh, individual centroids of the clusters, but then you can kind of expand them on demand and I can select multiples if I want to. And then another neat trick that it can do is, so if I grab kind of a big one like this one here, deselect that and expand it, I can also press another key and if it, Worked correctly. It spawned another window over here on my other monitor. And this is a kind of a zoomed in view of the same cluster. And in fact, it, it re-ran the clustering algorithm only on that, that one centroid that I had clicked and expanded. So if I like, select everything here and expand it, it should look the same. Is the other one, so I can kind of spin it around and get the same orientation. Um, but what it lets me do, uh, if I reset it, is now I can kind of probe deeper into this thing and kind of select even smaller little subclusters and expand them. Except I got them all. Select one. Expand. Okay. So anyway, that's the sort of tool that we're trying to build with these two libraries I'm going to talk about today. So this is the kind of thing that we hope to let researchers uh, build on their own using the tools that we're making. So let me get rid of these. Okay. So I want to give now a step back and give a little background on just neuroimaging and, and kind of where this technology is coming from. And I am not an expert uh, at neuroimaging. So, you know, bear with me as I try to explain these things to you that I'm not an expert in. Um, so neuroimaging is the process of trying to image the tissues in the brain uh, while the person is still alive. So these are uh, non-invasive imaging techniques. So um, kind of two big things to keep in mind are uh, the differences between direct and indirect imaging and uh, imaging for structure versus imaging for function. So on the top, this is a uh, direct image, I think this is probably a, a CT image. 
in the middle. This is something we're going to talk about more later. Uh, this is like a tractogram. This would be an indirect image because um, the actual scan doesn't produce these long uh, fibers. You have to kind of infer the, the presence of the fibers uh, by running some models. And then the bottom image here is a structural or a, a functional MRI. So that is an example of doing imaging for function rather than structure. You're trying to highlight where there is activity in the brain. So in case anyone's not familiar, just very basic uh, neuroanatomy. Uh, if you take a slice through the brain, it looks more or less like this. And uh, kind of the wrinkly outer part is what we call the gray matter. That's where the bodies of your neurons are. It's where kind of the layers of computation happen. And then this white part in between is what we call the white matter. It's where the axons of the neurons run. So that's kind of the wiring from one part of the brain to another. And so a lot of what I'll talk about today is the process of discerning the structure of this white matter and how different parts of the brain are connected. So we, uh, the kind of imaging I'm gonna talk about today is diffusion MRI. So before we can get there, we have to cover just what is uh, MRI itself. It stands for magnetic resonance imaging. This is the process of using magnetic fields and radio waves to uh, make a map of the structure of the brain. So in most cases, you are uh, imaging the resonance of hydrogen atoms, although technically you can do it with any uh, odd numbered atom. But hydrogen is convenient because it's very abundant in water and in fat, which happen to make up a good portion of your brain. So if you image using hydrogen, then you can get a good picture of uh, all of the water and the fat in your body, and in this case, in the brain. Does it have the odd numbered atoms? It does, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and that has to do with the fact that odd numbered atoms can generate a magnetic moment and therefore you can align them with an external magnetic field. Um, so that's, yeah, it's, uh, thanks. Thanks for uh, setting me up for the next slide, Bill. So uh, this is my one slide kind of version of, of how the MRI process works. Uh, it's grossly oversimplified, but essentially what you do is you have an external magnetic field that aligns the kind of water molecules up in your brain along the magnetic lines of this field. And then while they are aligned, they precess at some frequency. So they kind of wobble uh, about the, the magnetic lines the same way that the earth kind of wobbles as it orbits around the sun. And if you zap those molecules with, uh, in the case of hydrogen, with, with radio frequency uh, radiation, you can impart some uh, resonance energy to those molecules and, uh, or to the, the nuclei. And with that extra energy, they jump up to higher electron orbits. Um, and then whenever you stop the pulse of the RF, then they uh, lose that energy and they end up dropping down to a lower shell. And then they emit that extra energy they got uh, as photons. And then you capture those photons in an MRI image. So that is essentially how MRI works. You just you line up the, the nuclei, you zap them with some radio waves, you pull the energy out and then wait for them to kind of glow. And in the end, you get a series of uh, slices through the brain. So I, I skipped over a, a great deal of detail about how you actually get these individual slices, but it would take forever. It's really complicated. I don't fully understand it. So it's better than I just skip it. But this is, this is what you end up with. Um, this image here, this is starting at one side of the brain and then slowly working its way through the middle part here and then out the other side. Now you can take these slices and kind of piece them back together into a full 3D volume. And I want to reference my colleague Bill Sherman's talk from October 17th, volume rendering visualizations. So uh, we have some tools that you can do direct uh, volume rendering on, on this sort of data set. Uh, I will not actually be talking about uh, volume rendering in this case because DiPi doesn't really directly do volume rendering, although it could. It just does not yet. Yes? What's the typical resolution of each slice? Repeat the question. The question is, what is the typical resolution of each slice? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'd probably get like a, 
you know, a thousand by a thousand, maybe. I think the, the physical resolution is maybe on the order of like a millimeter there or less per voxel, I mean. So like a, a cubic millimeter per voxel, something like that. But you know, it varies wildly per, per uh, MRI machine. Yeah, so uh, that's the basics of MRI. Now we're gonna talk about diffusion MRI. So diffusion MRI is a technique to kind of discern the white matter structure of the brain here. So uh, it's non-invasive. And uh, the idea is that the, the water that's in the brain diffuses over time through the structures uh, of the brain, just kind of naturally how things, you know, how, uh, I don't know, ink diffuses in water, something like that. Um, and if you take multiple MRI scans, from different angles and so on, you can kind of piece together the flow, uh, the diffusion flow from, from one time to another. And through that, you can try to fit a model and uh, try to infer the structure um, that, that the molecules move <coughs> along the fibers uh, in the white matter. So pretty obvious applications for this are, uh, first of all, surgical planning. And that's what this image is of. This is a, uh, very large tumor in somebody's brain. And it's just uh, an image of how the white matter tracks are kind of wrapping around that tumor and how. Uh, so you can imagine if you were a surgeon, you would want to have an image like this so that you can you know, get an idea of which wires you're about to cut as you uh, slice into the, this guy's brain. So um, yeah, pretty important. Uh, it also is used in connectome mapping. So just trying to discern which parts of the brains are, are connected to others. Um, but there are much more, I mean, studies of uh, brain development and so on. You can image people over time and see how the, how the structure changes, things like that. So the idea, um, the actual mechanism for diffusion MRI is quite complex and I don't fully understand it, so I won't try to explain it to you. Um, I will give you some resources if you would like to learn more about it uh, in a few slides. But as I understand it, uh, the idea here is to get an idea of the water displacement, uh, kind of the average displacement in every voxel in the brain. So, um, you know, like I said, the, a single voxel might be like a cubic millimeter, something like that. That contains you know, thousands of, of axons in it. So you're not really going to get, um, you know, a single fiber. There, there's just no way to kind of trace down to that level of resolution. So what we're looking for is what is the average displacement of water through a voxel and kind of what can we infer from, from the average motion. So in this case here, um, we're just saying this voxel right here, kind of in the middle of the brain, has some kind of response uh, that, that looks like this. So it looks like it's kind of a linear feature there. So um, from these signals, we can then try to infer the structure. So if we start in the center here, this is that same kind of linear feature that we saw earlier. The model might infer that that is a bundle of fibers all traveling in that one direction. If you look at the image on the left, since there are kind of two peaks in this response here, the model would likely infer that that's two crossing bundles of fibers. And again, you know, it just kind of assumes that these are bundles of fibers because you have no idea of knowing, uh, you know, what a single fiber is doing. And the image on the right is just kind of a round, you know, spherical distribution here. So uh, you would assume that that means it's just kind of fibers going all over the place and you can't really figure out what's going on. It's just, you're getting signal, but it's kind of everywhere and, and hard to glean any useful structural information from it. So if you do have something like uh, the one in the center where you've got a pretty strong signal indicating a bundle, you can represent that using what they call diffusion tensor imaging. So uh, the kind of rough idea is that the, these fibers that you infer, you can represent them with uh, kind of three bases and then those you can map onto the three uh, axes of, a, of an ellipsoid. And so you can represent the little patch of fiber bundles in that voxel by the small uh, ellipsoid, a tensor ellipsoid thing. And when you put a bunch of those into an image together, you get something that looks kind of like this image on the left. 
So an image on the left, you have one of those ellipsoids per voxel in a slice through somebody's brain. And um, kind of the prominent features here are these, these uh, big, big blue uh, spherical things. But you'll notice on the right image that those are completely absent. And the reason why is this image on the right is trying to uh, actually say, you know, where are the peaks in the signal? Where, where can we infer that there are, are white matter bundles? And uh, even though these blue spheres are very prominent in the image and they're very large, that means there's, they're getting kind of a lot of signal from those places, they also are not very directional. So you can't really infer the structure that, that's passing through them. So when you kind of construct the, the, the path of, of the fibers, you just leave that blank because you don't really have any idea what's going on there. But for these other parts of the image where the ellipsoids are, are lining up pretty clearly, uh, for instance, right over here or like along here, you can see those directly correlate to, uh, to where the model thinks, thinks fibers are running. Another uh, way to represent these things the, is called an ODF, an orientation distribution function. So in this case, this image is showing, you know, you have the raw 3D volumetric signal, and then they compute some kind of density function, and then ultimately represent it with this ODF. Uh, the ODF in this case is, uh, could be representing something like an uncertainty in, in the alignment of the fiber. So you can imagine like there's a vector running through the center of this thing, and that it could be kind of pointing in any of these directions. You know, it could be going like this, or it could be going you know, like this. So um, that's one way you can represent kind of uncertainty in, in the direction of these things. Another thing I'll just briefly mention is uh, sometimes these are represented mathematically with spherical harmonics. Um, in this case, these are useful for uh, if you have crossing fibers. So if you, you know, if a single ellipsoid doesn't kind of get the job done because you have a model that, that can handle uh, crossing fibers, then you can represent kind of higher order things uh, with these uh, kind of different spherical harmonic representations. Uh, like this one right here would be just two crossing fibers. Spherical harmonics are also useful because they can be kind of computationally efficient. Um, so, um, that's a, a, an area of active research right now for us, but I'll just leave it at that for now. So that is my kind of whirlwind tour of my understanding of neuroimaging. If you want to learn from an expert how to, what this stuff actually means, there are some resources uh, here. So first of all, I'm here representing LF Gary Felitas, who is in the, here in intelligent systems engineering, specializing in neuroengineering. I'll point out that he is teaching a course in the spring of 2019 for undergrads and also for graduate students called Image Processing for Medical Applications. So this will take you through uh, the basics of image processing, you know, like denoising and that sort of thing, um, all the way up to diffusion tensor imaging and, and really high end uh, uh, kind of cutting edge imaging stuff. So. That's a specific course you can take. I'll also point out that in our physics department, they offer a BS and an MS in medical physics. That seems to be a joint program with Purdue and, and Indiana. And uh, they also do an accelerated degree where you can get a, a bachelor and master's in five years. So that's pretty great. And in psychology, look out for the imaging research facility. So that uh, we have MRI scanners here on campus and there are several faculty who are involved with this uh, research facility. And apparently you can book time and get your own MRI if you care to, so uh, good stuff. And I, I didn't look up what their individual courses were, but there are many faculty affiliated with this. I'm sure they're teaching classes on, on MRI and other imaging modalities. So moving on, uh, I'm here specifically to talk about DiPy. Uh, which is a Python library for doing the kind of imaging that I was just trying to describe to you. So uh, as is common in computer software, it is kind of a tortured acronym. Uh, DIPI stands for Diffusion Imaging in Python. Often mispronounced DIPI it is DIPI. Uh, so DIPI is a, a free and open source library running in Python. 
uh, to let you do, as, as it says here, computational neuroanatomy. Um, because Professor Gary Felitas' research is focused on diffusion MRI, this library too is focused on diffusion MRI, but it also contains uh, generic imaging algorithms. So things like registration or feature extraction, you know, just any kind of, uh, uh, I guess, low level image processing uh, algorithms are in there, but also these kind of high-end uh, DMRI algorithms uh, that I didn't go into that much detail of. Visual, visualization component of DivePy uh, wraps the visualization toolkit Python bindings, our old friend VTK, which has also been covered in previous talks here in our workshop series. And you can read more about it at DivePy.org. So DiPi was founded by Professor Gary Felitas as a uh, grad student, I believe, and has now grown to be a kind of broad international project, which when I looked it up yesterday has 82 contributors on GitHub so far, which is pretty great. And that includes five students who were funded by Google through the Python Software Foundation this previous summer to uh, work on DiPi and, and contribute features, uh, two of which were visualization students. So that's pretty great. And it's widely available. Of course, the code is on GitHub. And uh, Python users can access the releases through PyPy and Condaforge, which are both uh, package managers for the, the Python ecosystem. So I hinted at it earlier, but I am now going to officially say there's a new visualization library <laughs> being spawned from DiPy. Uh, what was once known as DiPyViz, the DiPyViz module, is now being spun off to its own thing called Fury, whose own tortured acronym I will reveal momentarily. <laughs> um, it is not quite, Fury is not quite in the release version of DiPy. The release is coming very soon, probably next week, we would hope. Um, so for the time being, if you try to work with, with DiPy, you will still be using the DiPyViz module, but uh, all of those components are now being moved over to Fury and DiPy itself will, will start referring to Fury instead of, of DiPyViz. Uh, we got a sweet URL for it, so you can get it at fury.gl, which is uh, pretty great. Costs a lot though from the Greenland government for that domain. Uh, it too is on uh, PyPy and Condaforge. Because it's a graphics library. <laughs> I don't know. I learned it from Uber. They, Uber got viz.gl and Kepler.gl and all these other GL libraries. So I said, hey, we should, we should get that too. It's cool. <laughs> and also fury.org was taken. So uh, yeah, so fury stands for free unified rendering in Python, which is probably worse even than DiPy. <laughs> but uh, what are you going to do? It was available on PyPy and, and it sounds cool. So, uh, so DiPyViz, now Fury, is a, a kind of a wrapper around VTK's Python bindings. And the idea here is to kind of simplify the API and make it more Pythonic, as Python users call it. Um, and in particular, what that means uh, in, in the workflow for these medical researchers is integrating it well with NumPy. So they're, their workflows are very often using uh, NumPy ND arrays and things like that. And uh, VTK doesn't, you know, has its own formats. It doesn't really natively work with, with uh, the NumPy formats. So part of, of Fury and, and DiPyViz is making VTK work well with, with a, a NumPy workflow. The UI elements that we've designed for Fury are and we've taken the approach of integrating them directly into the 3D scene. So um, if you have seen VTK applications before that have UI widgets, frequently they use Qt or some other kind of widget toolkit, meaning that you would have a, an application window with a panel on the side that has kind of widgets that you can interact with and then a separate 3D window. Uh, the goal here is to have those UI elements integrated directly into the scene so that um, I guess the interface is a little more akin to what you would find in a game engine, kind of keep it all in the one 3D scene. And the hope there is that then you can have um, some kind of 
natural interaction directly with objects in the 3D scene. Uh, it also has a, an integrated system for testing visual components. So everything that goes into Fury gets tested with continuous integration tools. Uh, so we have some level of confidence that, that things are working the way that they're supposed to. And newly introduced is uh, support for custom GPU shaders, which uh, we are doing through VTK's recent support for custom GPU shaders. So that's, that's an active uh, area of research but I will show a demo of it shortly. So the standard visualization pipeline looks like this. If you uh, were here for Bill's BTK talks, this should look familiar. Um, the idea is that you have some kind of uh, either a reader for a file format or a source, uh, like a, a primitive source from VTK, and then you work it through this uh, Pipeline. Where is my mouse? Here it is. You work it through this pipeline of filters and mappers and actors and renderers and render windows and interactors, um, which is all very descriptive, but it's also kind of a lot. And if you're writing VTK code, you'll see there is a lot of code that says something like filter x dot uh, input source reader dot get output, like just there's a lot of kind of wiring involved. It's a very verbose kind of way to program. So the hope with Fury is to simplify that a little bit. So uh, the inputs are primarily NumPy arrays, which come from things like uh, NiBabel is a Python package for loading lots of different kinds of neuroimaging formats from different kinds of scanners. And those output NumPy arrays. And then uh, the whole kind of filter mapper actor system uh, in DiPy is just replaced by kind of single actors that, that combine the three. So in that way, it's kind of less customizable because you're not piecing together each uh, individual component, but it presents users with kind of pre-made components that are, that are already pieced together out of these, these three parts. The renderer has like two days ago been renamed to scene. I'm not 100% sure why, but uh, it is. And then uh, the render window and interactor are kind of combined into this thing called the show manager. So again, just kind of an attempt to, to abstract out some of the kind of verbose details of VTK and, and make it a little simpler for users. So the process for installing uh, DiPy and Fury is quite simple if you are, just kind of a standard Python user, and you're familiar with pip, uh, which is the tool for installing packages that are in PyPy. You just pip install DiPy, pip install Fury, and you should be good to go because uh, they will pull in whatever dependencies they have, uh, including VTK. And if you are a, a user of Anaconda in the Python world, uh, it's similarly easy. You just conda install DiPy, only DiPy is not in the kind of default conda repo. You have to tell it you to look in the conda forge repo. So uh, DiPy and Fury are both on conda forge. I will note that these instructions don't necessarily work perfectly right now on every machine. We're ironing out some of the details. Uh, in particular, I was going to show you some demos of this system running on the research desktop. And it turns out there are some packaging problems uh, as it relates to PIP and Conda and the research desktop. So um, next semester, <laughs> research desktop, it's coming. It's getting die by soon. And uh, so I have a demo. I can't do it on, on red, but I can do it here in person. So this is I'm just running on my local machine. I just set up a... Um, a conda environment that is kind of fresh and clean, so there's not much in it. So if I do the list, I can see these are the packages that are installed. Uh, I mentioned NiBabel is a package for reading lots of different uh, imaging formats, neuroimaging formats. NumPy is used for computational stuff, as is SciPy. So we want to add uh, DiPy into this. So let me... Get back here. So first, this should just say pip install dipy. 
and it goes out to the to the web, fetches the dipine packages, installs that, and dependencies. You can see that a lot of these dependencies are already satisfied, and that should happen pretty quickly. And it's pulling down DiPy 0.14.0. .0. Uh, and for DiPy 0 0.14, which is the previous, well, it's the current release, but it is soon to be the previous release, VTK is an optional package for that release. When Fury comes, it will no longer be optional. So I will have to uh, pip install VTK myself manually. And that should go quickly. There it is. So if I do it again, pip list, you can now see that I have DiPy up here and BTK down here. And it pulls down BTK 8.1.2, which is very recent. So pretty easy to get up and running with uh, DiPy and Fury. And now I'm going to show a few examples. So let's see. Examples. So the first, uh, this is going to be an example of just loading an image and uh, displaying it in a couple of ways and how you can interact with it. So um, if I pull this back up, I should be able to say Python. What is this thing called? Python. It's slice that pie. And it popped up on my other display. Drag it over. OK, so here we go. This is uh, a BTK window showing a slice. And in this case, this is a, a 2D interactor. So my only real options. I thought I could zoom on this thing, but it's not letting me zoom. OK, well, let me just close that. And then it'll pop up another window. Oh, would you look at that? So. Again, I have to drag it over. And there's all that rotation and scaling that I did. <laughs> so now we, uh, we changed from a, a 2D, 2D interactor type to a 3D type. Only now I'm not, hmm. Is this something funny with the second monitor? Huh, how strange. Okay, so I can't interact with this window on the second monitor. Never had that happen before. Uh, okay, well, anyway, this is loading again the same image, only in this case, uh, I am, instead of coloring by intensity, I'm coloring by some scalar value. In this case, it's a fractional anisotropy. And if I close that once more, this is going to make my picking demo interesting if it's not going to let me interact with it. The hope here is that I should be able to click on a voxel and it should print the value of that. And I'm sure it is printing if I just drag it over here. <laughs> You'll just have to take my word for it, I guess, that I really did click somewhere and it really did just pop up. But uh, down here on this panel, and of course, I can't drag the panel up so you can see it. One moment. Get this panel up here. Okay, so I can report the position that I clicked on and the value uh, registered at that <laughs> position. And I'll also point out that I changed, um, if you look at the slide behind this, the image looks kind of nice and smooth, maybe a little low res, but, but uh, interpolated and smooth. I turned interpolation off in this case uh, so that you could know exactly which voxel you're clicking on. Now for the final part of this kind of slice viewer demo. Just one second. We will see a familiar face. So this was on one of my slides earlier. This is showing all the slices that are in this data set 
uh, arranged in a grid. And this one is also interactive and you can pick individual values. And again, apparently you'll have to just take my word for it that I can <laughs> zoom in on something on a particular slice that I want and click on it and it reports some new value. So, uh, bring over here. There you go. I zoomed in on a slice. I picked a new value. So there you go. Simple interactive application uh, for viewing just simple uh, uh, image slices. Now I can pull up another demo. In this case, this is the advanced demo. This is advanced. Um, so in this case, we're going to see uh, again just loading image slices and uh, also loading some streamlines and then some of our UI components. Uh, to interact with those uh, pieces. So it looks like it should be up. I just have to find it on my other monitor. Oh, and this is going to be very tedious if I can't actually interact with it. Okay. Not a super great demo. Um, so I'm loading slices here. Let me just reorient this thing under. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I can do that. Actually, let me see. How much PowerPoint is there left? Not much PowerPoint left. Okay, good idea, Eric. I'll just uh, kill this thing. Let me see. Look at that folks. Interactive demo. Am I still sharing? <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So in this case, all right. Yeah. So I've, I'm loading three slices that are orthogonal to each other, X, Y, and Z. Uh, you can see VTK doing a little bit of uh, LOD rendering there. So it, it doesn't like my streamlines. So it's uh, rendering them as points until I let go, which is very fancy feature. I can zoom in and out. Uh, and so our UI is just a simple way to, to move through the different slices. I can turn the opacity up and down on them. So now you can see these are distinct slices here. And yeah, that's uh, just a simple demo how you can wire up uh, UI elements to control things in the scene. One thing I'll point out about the way that the slicing works is that um, you know you can do this kind of slicing in VTK natively, but we are, in this case are doing the slicing ourselves using NumPy. And when this was very tightly integrated into DiPy, I think that was kind of critical because there were um, kind of slicing parts of like where DiPy itself needed slicing. And um, for Fury, since it is really the visualization only part, I think we will likely be porting some of that stuff to use VTK native uh, interaction instead of kind of computing slices on our own. Although we might have to have a shootout, shootout to see which is actually faster because a lot of the DiPy stuff is implemented in Cython. So it's actually running in C underneath. So it's pretty fast, even if it's not uh, like using VTK's native stuff. So anyway, that remains to be seen. I think just very briefly, I'll pull that other demo back up just so I can prove that it actually runs. There it is. Dave? So again, this is just... Bill, can uh, you hear me? Okay, so I thought it was just a 2D view before. Uh, it was not, it just wasn't interactive before. <laughs> so that's massively 
is pointing. And then here again is that view that is colored by a scalar. If I kill that, now I have interactive picking. Let me pull this up here. And if I zoom in, I can really kind of probe through a specific feature. Um, put this up here where you can see it. And I can click different things. So, you know, you can imagine being very curious about like, oh, I want to really sample along the edge of some feature that, that could be useful. And then the same here for this grid. So again, I can interact with the grid. I can zoom into some kind of feature I think is interesting. And then I can, uh, again, just do simple picking on it. Let's see, uh, you know, the value is zero out here. The value is 126 in here. That seems strange because they both look black. It's because the dynamic range of the image is higher than the, the dynamic range of the display. So you, you threshold it. And kind of, so in this case, 188 is still mapped to black. Yeah, so that is uh, my BGK demo. Oh, how do I get out of this mode now? I guess it doesn't matter. So, okay, I have one last demo that unfortunately is going to be for our local viewers only uh, because this one's going to run in stereo. So I'm gonna pass out stereo glasses and everyone can see that we can render things in 3D or my handy assistant Bill will pass out some glasses. <coughs> so for those of you viewing remotely, I'll just describe um, briefly. So this, this image here, that we are about to see a 3D interactive version. Uh, these are some of these uh, orientation distribution functions that I mentioned during the talk, these ODFs. There's one per voxel. And uh, in this case, it's, uh, you know, you can kind of trace where the white matter is again through which ones are, are aligned. And these ones that are more blobby are the ones where it's kind of ambiguous uh, where the, the paths are coming through. So, uh, this one is not 3D yet. <laughs> I have to switch inputs for that. Uh, so if I switch to, why did I change the GPU system? Okay, so if I make this big. Zoom in, so. So I'll try to do this without making people sick. This demo wasn't really designed for 3D. So, you know, it kind of, if I do it the wrong way, things will leap out on the screen and, and get kind of crazy looking, but. Um, I can kind of do this and give you some sense of depth in the 3D scene. So there you go, 3D visualization of uh, diffusion tensor imaging and ODFs using DiPy and soon to be Fury. So that is really the grand finale here. Uh, if anyone wants to walk through source code, I'm happy to do that. I just really didn't want to um, kind of expect people to kind of memorize the API for building these things. So um, I guess I'm open to questions from the audience. <laughs> Um, kind of off and on since, I guess it's about a year and a half, um, but only uh, one or two days a week in that time. Um, but yeah, the library itself is, I'm not sure how old, maybe a decade old, something like that. Oh, you know, I did leave out a demo. We've got another demo to do, people. <laughs> All right, let me flip back. <laughs> okay, hold on. I totally, when I skipped through my last couple of slides, I also skipped my reminder to run this last demo that has more of what we're doing recently in it. Um, um, oh, you know what? I forgot it because I accidentally closed it. Why did I do that? Okay, just one moment. Let's see. 
I have DiPy open now. Let me open Fury. And uh, I had this thing all set up. I need to check out this. Uh, let's see. Okay. I want to check this one out. Um, check out commit. <coughs> and just a minute here. It's going to be rad. I'm telling you. And I need to set interactive to true. And then run this. Well, here you go. Then you get a little a little shot of uh, what my development workstation looks like. Can you share your second screen? Where are you already? I don't know. Are you writing this on the PC? This is on my laptop. Okay. I don't think you're sharing. Okay. Let me try. In that case, we might have missed a lot. <laughs> well, you were before. It just happened. Okay. We back up. Yeah. Oh, there you are. Can I get rid of this thing? Yeah. Okay. Well. Anyway, okay, so this is an example of loading streamlines. So in this case, uh, these are represented by just plain OpenGL lines, and they're being colored by what is kind of a default color map in the field here. Um, it's an orientation color map, so roughly lines that are going from left to right are green colored, and lines that are going uh, north to south, up and down, are blue, and lines that go uh, in the what was the z direction there are uh, more red colored so that's just kind of a default way to render them if i kill that it'll pop up another one so in this case these are now being colored by some scalar value that's uh, on the points that that make up the streamlines i think again that's that uh, fa value fractional anisotropy anisotropy um, so one thing i'll point out about these uh, the way this is rendering, it's using OpenGL lines, which means if I zoom in on these things, they just always kind of look the same thickness. They always are uh, like one pixel thick, which uh, is nice and clean, and you can kind of see through it, which is pretty neat, but it's also aphysical. So uh, for some tasks, it can be difficult to, uh, like you don't really have any depth cues, so it can be difficult to kind of discern bundles uh, rendered this way. I'll come back to that in a second. This is another example of coloring by the same scalar value, only in this case, instead of some default kind of rainbow map, which we'll address. Um, now this is just using uh, a custom uh, scale from, from white to red. And this one is boring. It's just coloring everything orange. Skip that. This one is kind of the same as the other one. I'll just skip that. This one's super dumb. It's just what if you color each point with a random color? You just get like this crazy psychedelic uh, bundles. <laughs> so now we get to the interesting parts, uh, personally, I feel like. So this is uh, in a kind of our first uh, example in Fury of custom GPU shaders running in the library. Um, so the, the idea here is it looks a, an awful lot like that first image I pulled up with the OpenGL lines. It's, again, using the, kind of the orientation color map. But in this case, we have written a custom geometry shader so that uh, it, it takes in the normal lines, the streamlines, and then instead of rendering an OpenGL line, it renders an OpenGL triangle strip and uh, kind of on the fly orients each triangle toward the camera. So uh, the effect is essentially having like a wide line that also shows uh, kind of size attenuation with distance. So you get a little more of a depth cue. 
So if I can zoom in on this thing, you can see that the ones that are nearby get fat and that the ones that are in the distance are, are much smaller. So like there's a small one in the distance, here's a near one that's fat. One artifact of this rendering is that you can see these little kind of kinks uh, along the path. And so the, the tighter the, the curve is, the kind of the more kinky it gets. There is a way around that. It's just coming in, in version two of this kind of rendering technique. So for now, it's, it's just an artifact. And so that's an example of custom shaders that we wrote. The next one is an example of a custom shader written by the VTK developers themselves. So in this case, they're doing uh, a very similar technique to mine where they are, again, expanding the lines out into OpenGL triangle strips. But in this case, they behave the same way as OpenGL lines do, where they don't show any kind of uh, attenuation of, of size with distance. So uh, if we zoom in on them, again, you'll see that they, they always stay the same pixel size. But what's neat about this technique is that they are using a fragment shader to compute lighting on these triangle strips. And so as I kind of pan back and forth, you can see that the, you get kind of shading on them so that they have the appearance of being like real physical tubes, like stream tubes. But in fact, they are just simple kind of ribbons that are always pointed at the camera. So the idea here and in the previous example is uh, to kind of fake the appearance of real tubes while having little of the computational cost of, of rendering real tubes. Um, and especially since we're generating these things in the GPU instead of in the CPU. So um, there's that. And then this next one is an example that doesn't work all that well, but it's a combination of the two. So now I'm doing uh, my kind of size attenuation and their shading and you can see it's kind of a mixed bag. You, you don't really, uh, it's quite difficult to tune the parameters so that it actually looks good. So I'm not sure I recommend this, but this is what happens if you try to mix the two. And then just to close it out to kind of see how, um, how well we did with our fake tubes. These are real tubes. So, uh, and they're pretty thick, so I don't know, it, it looks kind of silly, but uh, these are real legit 3D tubes and you can see that, you know, kind of the shading looks the same, you know, they, the only real difference is that you actually see the, the caps on the end of the tubes. These little... How many tubes are there? This, uh, you know, we're, we're working on kind of metrics to compare the, the rendering performance of these. This is pretty small, I think it's like 5,500 individual lines. So if each line, if there are 5,500 of them and each one has, I don't know how many, a thousand points maybe. So you, and then, you know, if we zoom in on one of the tubes, we can see like what the resolution of the tube is. It looks like they're octagons probably. So. It's like a full, a full <laughs> oh, you might have tens of thousands of streamlines in them. Yeah. So it could be a pretty big difference. Um, and for, for other, um, examples like those kind of tensor ODF rendering things, the difference could be even bigger because each, each voxel might have, uh, well, it, it's quite a lot of data to store the, the geometry of those weird kind of distorted spheroid things. So that's, that's the next trick for us is to how to learn how to do those in the GPU and, and save a lot of memory and a lot of computation with that. So this one uh, is a, I mean, a noticeable performance gain, like even just in the time it took to, for the window to pop up was maybe a second or two longer than the others. So it's, for a little kind of toy example like this, it's pretty reasonable. Yeah. So, okay, for real this time, that is the last demo. <laughs> if there are any more questions, I will receive them uh, presently. Thank you. <laughs>